today's webinar, Track, Trace and Instrument or Instrument Set Management Systems, webinar one in this particular series. So we will be hosting a second webinar same time next week. This webinar is kindly brought to you by SAFMED. SAFMED has been your solutions partner for the last 30 years. As you know, in our webinar series, we focus on clinical practice, best practice, and getting the right techniques right so that we can look after our patients uh, correctly. So this is definitely an educational webinar ses um, session. Apologies. So today's webinar, as, you, as I said, we divided into two webinars, webinar one and webinar two. Webinar one, what we'll be covering, we'll look at what is tracking and tracing, what is the difference between them. We'll get to understand the various local and international guidelines regarding tracking and tracing. We'll look at tracking and tracing and its role in record keeping. We'll look at the requirements for record keeping within the CSSD environment. We'll review some published papers on nurses and their ability to do good record keeping. And we'll do a brief introduction into the different types of tracking and tracing systems. In webinar two is where we're going to take an in-depth look at tracking and tracing systems themselves. We'll get to better understand manual systems. We'll get to understand digital or computerized track and trace systems. We'll get to understand the difference between that and a tray or instrument management system. And once we've understood all of that, we'll then learn how these systems can be beneficial in terms of record keeping and compliance, in terms of staff training, in terms of CCD efficiencies and productivity, and of course, asset and resource management. Overall, that's how we will run these two webinars. Let's delve a little bit deeper into what is tracking and what is traceability? Tracking and tracing systems have been used in the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry for many, many, many years now. This particular paper defines tracing as being able to view the origin and attributes of a product at any stage during the supply chain. It defines tracking as being able to know the location of a product at any stage during the supply chain. Of course, within the CSSD, it is still the supply chain. Our customer just happens to be the operating room. In this published paper, which, is tart, which was titled The Potential Benefits of Traceability Solutions for Surgical Trays in the Irish Health Service, as I've said, the author describes and begins to tell us what tracking and tracing systems are. Knowing the location where a tray is at any time really, really matters. Being able to trace items is equally as important. This all gives us the ability to know which tray or which drawer, for example, was used on a particular patient. We can go back and know who actually processed that tray, how it was washed, how it was sterilized, which autoclave it went through or low temperature sterilizer it was sterilized in, and even where it was stored before it was actually used. Why does that matter? Well, we'll delve into that a little deeper. Generally speaking, there are two main types of tracking and tracing systems. There's a manual system, and then there are digital or computerized systems. Manual systems in general consist of label guns, printers, label gun printers that are envelopes, some form of user identification. And generally, all of this needs to be associated with a process challenge device, which is going to help us validate a certain uh, cycle parameters. Digital or computerized systems, of course, are going to need a computer, some form of hardware, some form of software, maybe some service to store all of that data, a way to uniquely identify the tray itself, to uniquely identify it once it's been wrapped, so a label on the outside, going to need some form of scanner, um, some form of user identification that is unique. And again, it still needs to be associated with the process challenge devices that we use. Now, the majority of private hospitals in South Africa and a number of the provincial hospitals are already using some sort of 
formal sort of manual documentation systems. And a few hospitals have started to install digital systems or computer-based systems. So what do the guidelines teach us about tracking and, and, and traceability? So let's start with the World Health Organization. As you know, we often refer to the World Health Organization guidelines. They are very um, succinct. They cover everybody, really. They take into account hospitals and systems with lots of resources. And they also take into account environments where we don't have that many resources necessarily available to us. The World Health Organization reminds us that we should have a system in place that's either manual or computerized for tracking and tracing devices to patients, especially in the event of medical device recall. If we have a sterilization failure, we're going to need to have a way to be able to recall our, uh, our sets. The World Health Organization goes on to say that you should have documentation and records for every stage of the decontamination cycle. Some of the systems that we currently use, especially some of our manual systems, don't necessarily allow for that. So there's aspects that we cover at the moment with our manual systems, but perhaps aspects that aren't covered, if you think about what is stated here. How do we get accurate records? How do we keep documents for every stage of the decontamination cycle? And of course, those records and documents must be maintained as per our regional legal requirements. And we'll cover a little bit of that later in our presentation today. The National Health Act of 2003 obliges all healthcare establishments to create and maintain a health record for every patient that uses their facility. The healthcare establishment, the hospital, has a duty to prevent unauthorized access to those records, and those records have to be stored safely and correctly. And that includes preventing the records from being lost or being damaged. Being damaged can, of course, be something like a fire, or water damage, or pests, or vermin, as you know, rats, or things that could possibly eat all of the documents, like fish moths, an important concept in our world. The Health Professional Council of South Africa offers the following guidance on the retention of medical records. And they say that records should be kept for at least six years until they become dormant. Records of minors should be kept until the minor is 21 years of age. Records of patients who are mentally impaired should be kept until the patient's death. And any records pertaining to illness or accident arising from a person's occupation should be kept for 20 years after the treatment has ended. That's a long time and a lot of record keeping that is required in our environment. The National Health Act of 61, or National Health Act number 61 of 2003, provided for the creation of the Office of Health Standards Compliance. The Office of Health Standards Compliance were actually the ones who developed the National Core Standards. I'm very sure everybody is familiar with our National Core Standards. The Office of Healthcare Standards Compliance is tasked with auditing all of our hospitals, and they have got various audit tools to do that with. They also have an audit tool for the storage of medical records, because medical records are so important. That audit tool states that the health establishment must ensure that there's restricted access to the storage area, that the shelves where everything is put is labelled. It even goes on to include that there must be good lighting, that there is a counter to be able to sort all of this information. And of course, when inspecting, the auditors are going to check that the storage area is clean. They're going to look for dust. They're going to look for rodents or pests in the area. I've personally had quite a few experiences in my nursing career where documentation was reviewed as part of a legal incident. And I'm very, very sensitive and very, very concerned about accurate record keeping and how it is we store all of our records. In one of the particular incidents that I was involved in, the theatre register was called to question. And some of our 
of our registers over a period of time had been lost, stolen or disappeared. And that can really be a tricky thing to manage. So record keeping and how we store those records are very important to me. If I walk into a CCSD and I find the manual envelopes <clears throat> tossed in a corner or thrown in a drawer or heaped together somewhere with no control, no accuracy, no neatness, I get very, very concerned because I'm well aware of how important this documentation, documentation can be. In this research paper published in the American Association of Operating Room Nurses Journal, uh, it, this research looked at the quality of perioperative nurses documentation in Denmark. Goes on to talk about the fact that nursing care documentation is important for clinical decision making and it can potentially affect the patient's safety. The record keeping documentation we do in the CCSD is equally as important as the perioperative documentation and it definitely can affect the patient's safety. If we, for example, record that our Bowedic test passed uh, or or we recorded that our BI has passed, but in fact it didn't, that could have a really profound effect on the patient. Documentation in the perioperative setting, as they describe in this, in this published paper, has often been poor and incomplete, and that's very true for CCSD as well. Some staff are really good with documentation and some really weren't and really aren't. And the goal of this particular research paper was to try to understand what influenced the quality of staff documentation? Well, they found quite a few things in this research, and they found that a number of things affected the quality of the documentation, including the culture of the department. So if, for example, senior members of the team weren't great or didn't enforce good record keeping, uh, everyone in the team wouldn't really be great at their records either. Of course, when staff are busy, we know that, and when we have time constraints, the quality of documentation was worse. And certain um, um, administrative things like workspace or having the ability or a place to write or having access to certain things like pens will all affect the quality of record keeping. With the, apologies for that. So even things like not having envelopes with pens to write with can affect the quality of record keeping. In hospitals that have already installed electronic records or computer systems, remember this is the American based publication, where the workstation was placed also affected the quality of record keeping. So very important to bear that in mind. If you are installing a fancy system or a nice electronic track and trace system, where you install the workstation needs to be logical, it needs to be convenient, and it needs to be able to help the workflow. In the manual systems, often, as you've seen in the past, and a lot of people do that, to so actually hang our envelopes next to the autoclave, making it easy to access an important thing to try bear in mind to keep our documentation going. It goes on to say in this research that um, staff completing documentation um, sometimes happens, they do that before even the tasks have been done. Now that sounds really weird, but it happens often. We often in the theatre will pre bill we've done that many times, or sometimes pre-record as much of the information as we can. I've now done an audit before where somebody had filled out their BR results for the entire month in advance. This is very dangerous. This publication stated that using specialised documentation systems could be helpful. So electronic track and trace systems, of course, are specialised documentation systems, and perhaps that's one of the ways of making sure we keep accurate records. Moving to the South African setting, this research uh, was quite an eye-opener. It was published in the Curators Journal, the South African Journal, in 2018 already. And in this particular study, the purpose was to explore and describe the challenges experienced by nurses with regard to record keeping at selected public hospitals in the Vembe district of Limpopo. 
Going through the introduction in the background, it reminds us that good nursing practice requires detailed rec record keeping that's comprehensive, timely, and accurate. Without complete recording, there is no evidence to prove that particular care was given or that something was done. We know the old saying, if it's not, rec if it's not recorded, it's not done. If it's not written, it's not done. Furthermore, poor record keeping not only undermines patient care, but it makes the nurse more vulnerable to legal claims. How scary is that? The South African Nursing Council, um, R387, relates to the accident of omissions, and it requires a nurse to keep clear and accurate records of all nursing actions done to the patient at all times. And failure to do so constitutes professional misconduct. And some can actually take disciplinary action against you for failing to keep correct documentation. Every piece of evidence that we need and we document in the CCSD is patient information. It's hospital records. It is critical that we keep these records correctly and accurately. The publication goes on to refer to the fact that despite numerous efforts by nurse managers to improve record keeping, inaccurate, inaccurate recording remains a global challenge. It goes on to describe a SANC report from a number of years ago, so I'd love to see the statistics that uh, exist currently. In this particular report, it talks about 769 nurses who were found guilty of professional misconduct, and in 587 of those incidences, amongst other, there was failure to recall their nursing actions in the patient record. The research article then reported on an incident where a lawsuit required the Limpopo Health Department to pay 1.7 million rand for negligence as a consequence of nurses failing to make complete recording of their nursing interventions. Record keeping is critical. When I was doing the research for this webinar, I uh, did some background research and looked at the SANC website as well. On the SANC website, there is um, a set of competencies that are, are listed by SANC for perioperative nurse specialist. In there, under the domain of clinical practice, it states that competent perioperative nurses also have to ensure the decontamination process have been validated. So not only is it about CSSD, but every theatre nurse standing there at the table needs to ensure that all the background work that had to happen in the CSSD was actually done. Important point to bear in mind, we are all responsible. Okay, we've already said that the World Health Organization said we need some form of system, we need some form of um, uh, manual or, or computerized documentation system in place for recording what's happening in the CSSD. What does the rest of the world have to say, or what do some of the other countries have to say? This is the Health Service Executive from Ireland. The Health Service Executive is a large organization of over 100,000 people whose job it is to run all the public health services in Ireland. In the HSC standards for central decontamination uh, uh, units, it states, systems should be in place to allow the methods, operational cycles, and personnel involved in the processing of a particular reusable set of device to be tracked through the decontaminant decontamination process in order to permit retrospective verification that the processes have been carried out effectively. So this is not just about recalling in the event of sterilization failure. This is being able to verify retrospectively that all steps, all steps of the decontamination process were carried out effectively. So to do that, we have to record a hell of a lot of information. The HSC guidelines go on to state that IT-based systems are preferred and that manual-based systems should only be used for smaller units with a very low turnaround or for backup in the event of IT failure. The IT systems selected should be capable of maintaining traceability for items that have been loaned from commercial organizations or other healthcare organizations. So whatever tracking and tracing system you're using, you need to be able to record your loan sets that come in 
or if you borrow a set from the hospital next door because you have a problem or yours is broken or lost, you need to be able to record that as well, be able to track and trace that as well. It goes on to state in their, in their instance that records relating to decontamination processes must be maintained for the lifetime of the set of the device plus 11 years. That is a very interesting concept. What do the Americans have to say? So for that, we go to Amy ST79, the American National Standard, uh, the Comprehensive Guide to Steam Sterilization and Sterility Assurance in Healthcare Facilities. It states that each package or item intended for use as a sterile product should be la labeled with a lot control identifier to allow full traceability of that item to the, the, item to the patient and, um, and or alternatively an instrument tracking system may be used. Each load should have a load control record and that includes detailed contents list including specific identification of sets and contents of sealable pouches in every load. Do we know exactly what we put in every load? I hope so. The lot controller identifier should be able to identify the sterilizer number or code, a detailed list of the contents, the person who assembled the packaging, the state of sterilization, not just the person who actually loaded the autoclave, the person who assembled it. The date of the sterilization, the cycle number, and where applicable the patient. They also go on to state that any item that is processed using immediate use steam sterilization, the term we often use, flash, should also include some form of patient identifier. I wonder how many of us can actually identify every patient that that an item was used on that had been flashed or immediately steam sterilized. What did they say in England? Hmm. For the English guidelines, we refer to the HTM, the Health Technical Memorandum. 6.17 states that there is a need to track and trace reusable, reusable surgical instruments through their use and their reprocessing. Records should be maintained for the instrument sets identifying the cleaning and sterilization method used, a record of the decontamination equipment and the cycle, identity of the person undertaking the decontamination at each stage of the cycle, and the patients on whom the sets have been used, as well as the details of the procedures that the patient had. That's a lot of stuff to record. Very, very difficult to try and do that with a manual system. The HTM says that the decontamination lead or the person in charge is responsible for ensuring that tracking and tracing is done, and it includes tracking and tracing of loan sets. Of course, part of tracking and tracing in the UK, uh, part of the issue is around Krishvald Jacobs disease. Remember, in the UK, they've got two full sets of instrumentation. One set of instrumentation that is used on patients born before 1997 and those born after 1997. Now, if you think about it clearly in the South African setting, we have had quite a few incidences already of Krushevald Jacobs disease or patients diagnosed with Krushevald Jacobs disease. We've had presentations on that before at our CFSA uh, Africa Health Congress. So something we have to bear in mind, if we have a patient that's diagnosed with Krusevald Jacobs disease, how are we going to identify exactly which set was used in them? And how are we going to identify subsequently, because remember, you're only going to find out about it maybe weeks later, what other patient that same set was used on? Because that, that patient is at great risk. Going now to the Office of Health Standards Compliance Audit Tool. So their audit tool, specifically for CSSD, now we spoke earlier about the audit tool that deals uh, with documentation. Now we're talking about the audit tool that deals specifically with CSSD. It goes on to state, uh, I have only captured a few areas of this, of this document. There are numerous things to take into account. Um, but of course it states that the success of sterilization procedures must be monitored. All sterilization failures must be docu documented 
all sterilization failures must be investigated. We must be able to determine the cause of the failure and there should be some form of report and investigation that must be made available. Where are we going to make sure that they were correct? How are we going to monitor it? How are we going to know if there are any sterilization failures? Where are we going to report this information? It states that there should be a policy or a standard operating procedure for guidance of decontamination process. You need to have one. You need to have a system for tracking and tracing items. It does say that in the unlikely event of sterilization cycle failure, so that items can be recalled. They might use the word unlikely, but it does happen, and I think it happens relatively often where we have an event where there is some form of sterilization failure. What happens when you open the set? We're in theater, we open the set, the scrub sister, the scrub person looks inside, and the chemical indicator hasn't changed color. What do we do then? Because that really, really matters. It's quite often that, that all of our, our indicators have, have passed, our indicators as in the biodeck has passed, the BI has passed, the external chemical indicators look fine, but when you open a set on the inside, the internal chemical indicator hasn't changed. What happened then? We have to have some form of tracking system and we have to have some form of uh, label or identifier on the outside of our packs and our sets. We need to be able to recall back to that particular batch, that we have a unique batch number, that we can recall all of these items in the event of need. Another publication that was quite an eye-opener and not pleasant to read. Um, in fact, none of these publications were pleasant to read because they, they deal with the fact that we're all human and they deal with the fact that errors occur. And we all hope that we don't make errors, but unfortunately, sometimes they do. In this AORN publication, Anna Warren discusses the impact of fatigue on charting errors. Sleep deprivation, as I'm sure you're very well aware of, has a huge effect on our ability to concentrate and on our, mem on our memories. Loss of sleep increases the risk of accidents and errors. Fatigue and insufficient rest periods can contribute with other doubt to documentation errors. We have such staff constraints at the moment, both in the operating room and the CECD environment. We have uh, staff constraints in terms of people that are, are adequately trained, or we have changeover of staff all the time, makes it quite difficult. And we're losing a lot of our knowledge base uh, often to retirement. I'm sure there are many healthcare workers that are burnt out at the moment. And it seems to me that we need to do everything possible to, um, to help us with our compliance. Will having an electronic system make it better? It's a good question. Having a system that maybe uh, when we try to scan a set into the autoclave and it's not supposed to go in the autoclave, it's only meant to go into a low temperature steriliser and we get an alert that says, mm, warning, you're not supposed to put this in the autoclave. Surely that's going to help us somewhere, somehow. These are things we really and truly need to consider going forward. When you look at tracking and tracing systems as a, as a whole, we can divide them, as we said a little bit earlier, into manual systems and into digital systems. Of the digital systems that are available, there are systems that focus more on tracking and tracing, and there are systems that focus more on instrument management. Instrument management systems are sometimes additional programs that you can buy with one particular system, or there may be something that can be used as a standalone. And all of these things have different uh, pros and cons, different abilities, and have all have ways in which they can help and assist us in our CCSDs. Quite a few of these systems are now available in the South African system uh, settings. The manual system, as I spoke to about, I think we've been using for over 15 years now. Um, and and many, uh, many private hospitals are now starting to install the um, digital-based systems, especially now for managing uh, stock, for billing, for ordering, for all of these kinds of things now. So it seems like it's a logical uh, move to, towards uh, digital systems. All of these systems, whether they're manual, whether they're digital, they're computer-based, they are all going to help us to comply with our statutory obligations to maintain good healthcare records. So thank you very much for joining us today for our succinct session.
And what I think we've learned today is we've learned that in order to be compliant, we need some form of tracking and tracing system. We've learned that nursing care, nursing tasks are important and we have to document them. And the old adage, if it's not written, it's not done, is very important. We've learned that nurses don't always do what they should be doing in terms of maintaining their records. We've learned that a multitude of things can impact on the quality of our nursing documentation and record keeping in the CSSD. All sorts of things affect us. And we've also learned that the World Health Organization, the Office of Healthcare Standards Compliance, the American Guidelines, the Irish Guidelines and the English Guidelines call for the use of some form of tracking and tracing system. Thank you very much for joining us today. As normal, in a day or two, we'll send you the link to the short survey and the test questions. If you complete those, we will supply you with a certificate of attendance. And hopefully you'll join us again next week, same time, same place, for part two of our webinar. We will go into a lot more detail on how these systems actually work. Thank you so much.